The Discover College Soccer Podcast is sponsored by VO. VO is the number one AI camera solution helping players capture college recruitment videos. Check out their new starter and family options by clicking on the link in the description or visit Discover College Soccer to learn more. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Discover College Soccer. Today, I'm lucky enough to be joined by Coach Dave Gifford from VCU. Welcome, Coach. Thanks, Matt. It's great to be here. Yeah, glad to have you. Always good to talk to to folks from Virginia. I spent many, many moons there, although, you know, down here in Florida now. But uh, we're talking here beginning of June. Um, On the recruiting side, 10 days away from that famous June 15th date that every, you know, a lot of people get concerned with. How important is that date for you guys? How much work are you going to be doing on June 15th or is, is for, especially on the guy side is kind of two years out. It's not even really that important right now. No, to be honest at this point, you know, not very important. I, I wouldn't say totally irrelevant, but, but pretty irrelevant. You know, I think that, uh, you know, when you're comparing the two sides of the game and, and this is evolving and changing, you know, all the time, but, you know, on the women's side, you, you have so many opportunities and historically you haven't had um, enough good players for those opportunities. Um, and and now as time has gone on and the, and the women's game has continued to grow both in our country, but also abroad, you know, I, I think it, it's, it's becoming more and more competitive and more and more difficult. And I think, you know, over the course of time, it's, it's slowing a little bit where, you know, you don't see as many, um, whether the, the number of good players has increased or, you know, some enforcement of some of these different rules and policies has helped. But you don't see as many girls at 13 and 14 years old making commitments like they were eight or 10 years ago. And, and so that's really positive, I think, for everybody. You know, for us, um, you know, if there's somebody that, that we really track on and reach out to on the 15th, then great. But, you know, for the most part, it's so far away from the, the picture that we're looking at. You know, it's, uh, you know, obviously from a negative standpoint for a lot of the young players in our country, you know, you have the the advent of the transfer portal and, and NIL and all some of those things that, you uh, you know, that have changed recruiting over the last, you know, three, four years and is, and are going to continue to, you know, really evolve that piece where, you know, more and more you're you're having a lot of, of top division one and, and really not even top division one, but the middle of the road and the bottom. I mean, they would prefer to add a 22 or 23 year old um you know, player who's had three or four seasons of college already, they're more ready to go. And and so, you know, the, the idea of calling a 15 or 16 year old um, rising junior on June 15th seems, you know, very strange in the current landscape, but there will be some calls on the guy's side. You know, I think that more than anything, you know, what you're doing is great because, you know, what I find is you have a lot of worries and concerns from parents, from coaches, from, you know, sometimes the players, hey, what's happening? Oh, is this going on? Am I late? You know, those types of things. And, and uh, you know, I think it's great to get the information out there that most uh, most young men in this position should not be expecting their phone to be blowing up at, uh, you know, at midnight Eastern time on, <laughs> on the 15th of June. Um, now, you know, if I was a, a coach of a women's team, maybe, uh, like I said earlier, maybe I'd feel differently and, and maybe I'd say, hey, put your phone on silent if you don't want to talk um, until you're ready to talk. And and so, but I, in, in our side of the game, you just don't see that as often with very many players. Sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. What have you seen? I mean, as you've been at VCU now, you said this is the start of year 15, I believe. So in the last few years, with the advent of the transfer portal and I guess we'll, we'll just call it the globalization, right. Of, of college soccer, at least um, have, have you kind of changed the way you operate in terms of, of your recruiting calendar and where you go and how you look for players or, or, or is it kind of stayed the same or, or, or what? 
Well, I think we're probably in the minority where we've stayed pretty similar, right? I mean, how we play, what we do, uh, how we try to help our players develop and, and the number of our guys whose goals are to play professionally beyond, um, you know, their college experience. I, I can't make big changes and big adaptations I, uh, to a player. I can't help them to make, you know, the gains that they need to from where they are now to where they want to go in three months or a year in three months like that just that just doesn't happen uh and so i think for a large majority of division one you know you you felt like hey let's get older uh let's be more ready more experienced i mean for the last 12 13 years we've, we've played one of the best five or six schedules in the country every year and the biggest difference i've seen the last three or four years is at the starting lineup right when they call the, the players out um, it's like grad student, grad student, you know, senior, grad student, grad student, grad student, junior. Oh, that's a young player for them. Um, and, you know, and, and that program to program in a lot of the top places, um, that's the direction that it's gone, right? And there's just such a big difference between an 18-year-old and a 24-year-old or a 25-year-old. Like there's an enormous difference, not just in maturity and, and age and experiences that occurred here in the college game, but, you know, in a lot of places that these young folks come from, um, you know, you got players coming from um, as the NCA has become more lenient and more understanding. You have players coming from whether it's Europe or South America or wherever, you know, developed football in countries uh, that players might be recruited from. You have guys coming who have spent three, four, five years in pro environments, just haven't played a certain number of games or haven't gotten paid a certain amount or, you know, can't be proven that they signed with an agent or whatever it might be. And, you know, the experience that that player has versus an 18 year old from, um, you know, from Arlington in uh, Northern Virginia. I mean, it's, that's a big, big difference. Right. And, and so, um, yeah, you do see that a lot, you know, on my on our end, again, one of the things that I feel like college soccer is great for, and it's not a popular opinion in the U.S. soccer circles of people that, quite frankly, don't know. Um, you know, they think, oh, college just is a waste. It's not helping develop players. No, the real problem, quite frankly, is in the youth game. Um, the, the game's unrealistic. It's so slow. Um, you, the, it's not the job of the club or the, the director or the coaches to develop players. It's the job to create teams that players and their families enjoy to be a part of, to win, to continue back again the next year. And that's their job, right? I think we've got a lot of really, really good quality youth coaches in our country, but their job is not to develop a player. And, you know, what you find in, in the majority, even though our nation's so large, the number of players is uh, is at the highest that it's ever been. Um, you know, what you find is the ones who really have aspirations to move on and play beyond, they're out finding alternative solutions. How do I get better? How do I, you know, how do I get more touches? How do I improve in these things? Because I want more than what, as crazy as this sounds, four or five nights a week of training gives me. Um, and th that's just the reality. But I don't think it's anybody's fault. It's just the the, the genesis of our system and, and how the game in our country works. And so, you know, I think from the perspective of how does that fit us? Well, OK, for a handful of players in our country, the, the pathway is to go directly into a professional team. Now, there's a difference between a player who's ready to do that and a player who's in an MLS academy who, quite frankly, um, you know, those teams have invested now in the last five or six years pretty significant resources in, um, and they now need to find a way to monetize those players. And, you know, up until this winter, you know, we were one of the only countries in the world that, does, that don't participate in FIFA training compensation. And so everywhere else in the world from a certain age on, I think it's from 13 or 12 on, those clubs that a player is with, they're entitled to compensation from the first professional contract that that player receives. And so those clubs' business models are set up for 
them to develop players, right? And and the coaches at the U14 and U16 and U18, whatever ages that country or that club happens to sponsors, they're evaluated upon how many players progress from their group and they're ready to progress on to the next group. And the young men and women who coach, not all of us are so young anymore, but the ones who coach in the youth game in our country, you're evaluated on you know how many parents complain, how happy the kids are, how much you win, because again, as a, and I'm a parent, I have two kids that play. Um, and, you know, I sit on the sideline and listen to all the, the craziness from all of my sons and daughters, friends. And, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> I can understand you're, you're, you're putting a lot of time and energy and money into it. And you want to make sure that your child has a good experience because you're a consumer uh, and these other in essence, every other high level soccer environment in the world, um, the parents aren't involved. The club identifies and selects the kids. And then, you know, the parents get told, here's what happens. Here's what it is. But on a positive note, uh, the parents aren't stroking a check uh, on a negative side. The uh, the club views your your son as a commodity and uh and commodities need to be shaped and valued and and taken advantage of and sold and that's the way the business works and so it's not all doom and gloom because you know we've got millions of kids in our country who get to play and have an amazing pathway and experience that they enjoy um it's a game it's fun if you're i always tell my son's uh friends parents you know look if your son goes through a terrible time they're going to put him on the next team down if he does great, they're going to move him to the next team up. Either way, he's got 16 friends that uh, he hangs out with. They all have similar interests and likes. You get to spend your free time instead of, you know, doing whatever the kids do on their phone or the computer. You know, you're at the soccer fields. You're traveling together as a family. You know, that's what it is. And and But there's a gap that exists in that model, and it's a gap of, okay, a kid really loves to play. He has some natural ability, but the the space has grown from, you know, you at, at 11 versus a kid in Spain at 11. They were similar. Then from 11 to 18, that kid became, in essence, a professional, and your kid continued to be a kid. Um, now, he doesn't not have tools, not have qualities, but how do you then take that player create an environment where there's an opportunity for them if they're able to do it, um, you know, to not only continue their educational process, continue the part that they love, but hey, can we create now an environment to bring out, you know, some of the things that you've missed, um, bring you up to speed and, and try to help you to re-enter back into, you know, back into the pyramid at some point, whether it's in our country, into USL, USL1, USL Championship, into MLS Next Pro, into MLS, or we've had a lot of guys that, you know, have, have entered into those uh, those leagues abroad as well. And, and whether it's in the Netherlands or Spain or, you know, back in their home country, maybe we've had kids come from places and, and re-enter back into uh, to those countries. French kids go back to France, Costa Rican kids go back to Costa Rica. Uh, you know, I think there's there's a lot of possibilities out there, but on our end, and it comes back to your initial question, right? Of okay, how big is June fifteenth? Well, I'm looking when I look at a player for VCU. You know, if I'm watching you as a high school junior, for example, um, well, you got your whole junior year, then you have your whole senior year, then you have four and a half years with me. And so I'm looking at a player six and a half years away from where we can help you to get to. And, and I always talk to players and their families when they're, they're in to visit, like, hey, think about yourself six and a half years ago today. How different are you six and a half years ago? Well, that's the same amount of time that we have to work together. And so, you know, from my perspective, I want to get as accurate of a picture as I can um, of what that person is capable of becoming, right? And, and you know, six and a half years is a little bit harder to predict than five and a half years and four and a half years, et cetera, et cetera. And so we've, we've had a lot of years where we haven't even taken a commitment until after Halloween of a player's senior year. 
Um, and, you know, then we've, we've gone all the way up through, you know, we do like a, like a two day little prospect camp, uh, that we don't advertise a lot just to kids who are like, Hey, you want to sure. come, come with our guys. And, and we do it right before preseason. <clears throat> and we've added three or four times guys at that camp to start like four days later. Um, and so, you know, that tends to be kind of the window that we work in most often. And, you know, for players in other parts of the world, that seems to be a similar timeline too, because in, in November, two years, or excuse me, June, two years earlier, all those guys think they're going to be pros. And it's not until April or May of, you know, their gap year or their, their last year that they realize, wow, this isn't going to go the way I thought what's going to happen next. Um, so that's a really long answer <laughs> Matt, to, uh, you know, how important is June 15th? Not really, to be okay. honest. Well, I appreciate that. It's some great insights and, uh, I definitely agree on, on, on many of those points, but let's talk a little bit more about VCU. Uh, you know, I mean, you guys are a perennial strong division one men's program, but I'm sure there's some folks out there, maybe not familiar with the school. So you've been there 15 years now. You've got some great insights. What is it about the school that, that, that you specifically enjoy? What, what makes it unique? Maybe some things we wouldn't even know by going through the website. Yeah. I mean, I think what I've always enjoyed and, and what has kept me at VCU for the last 15 years is the, the type of person and type of player that we get to work with. Right. And, and our game and our country in one of the only countries in the world is filled with really um, one type of player specifically from a very affluent background, um, good family, has the expendable income to be able to do a lot of things. Many options in life are open to them. And, you know, that's not always the case in our country, but it's interesting because our game in general in most of the world is a game for the people, right? There's very little cost. Um, you know, you, as I travel all over different parts of the world, I mean, kids are playing with no shoes on, on concrete with, uh, you know, with rags rolled up as a ball with a plastic bottle with tape on it as a ball. Um, you know, and I make fun and, and myself, right. As my five-year-old daughter and I roll out to what looks like a putting green for her to go play in her U5 uh, go ahead, recreational game on the nicest field that any of my players would have ever played on. Uh, you know, and, and what I like about VCU, both during my time here, but also, you know, for a long, long time prior to that, is it's always been a place for, you know, first generation college students, right? Like, and, and my team is, is, we try to create the group to look like the world, right? And feel like the world. Um, and, and so, you know, you'll have one guy on the team who's one of the brightest and maybe best students at the university. We've got an excellent uh, medical school, one of the best medical schools on the East Coast, a business school, engineering. You know, a lot of, of these pieces are really, really top academically. But then we've got, you know, a handful of guys who, who don't speak English. Right. And, and maybe aren't even good students and they don't speak English and, and they're barely qualifiers. And, you know, we've had guys from some of the poorest backgrounds in uh, in the world um, and they live with guys who, you know, their parents are uh, are surgeons. Right. I mean, we in our first recruiting class and two guys that lived together for four years, we had one guy from a country uh, not as affluent as the U.S., who was homeless from age seven to age 17 and lived on the street and, and popped around from one family or, or, you know, gosh, under a bridge or whatever. Uh, and he lived with a guy whose father was one of the leading kidney uh, research physicians on the East coast. And, and they were roommates and best friends and played in the midfield together. And, and that kind of thing, I really, really enjoy um, I don't know that I would be as fulfilled or as enjoyed if my whole team were guys who, quite frankly, only needed us or, or our staff or our athletic department just to help them play soccer. Um, so many folks, you know, they're they're changing the direction of their life, their family's life. It, it can be multi-generational, whether they're from here in Virginia Beach and and or 
Roanoke or, or Richmond or wherever it might be, or whether it's, you know, guys from Senegal or Ghana or, or Jamaica or, you know, wherever they might come from. Um, that part is really, really, really enjoyable and fulfilling to go to work with every day. Yeah, I can imagine that. That's awesome. Well, in terms, you mentioned staff. So um, let's talk a little bit more about the team side of things. What, Besides yourself, what does your staff look like? What roles does everybody play? What other support staff maybe uh, does does uh, the athletic department supply to help with the team in various ways? Sure. So, you, you know, it, it evolves and changes over time, but but we've got, you know, two full-time assistants, um, Lucas Paulini, who's been with us now. He played with us my first year. Uh, then left to play professionally, came back to finish his degree and was like a GA while he did that, then left to go work full time as uh, as an assistant somewhere else and then came back. So he just kind of keeps yo-yoing, you know, back and forth. He's been with us now in this third go around. Um, he came back during right at the beginning of COVID. Um, and so he's been with us since I guess that was spring of 20. Then uh, one of our longtime assistant coaches who'd been with us for since he came, when I came, he left to take the head coaching job at Mount St. Mary's this past uh, end of the fall. And then we hired uh, Carlos Pedraza, who was one of the right-hand guys down at Montverde for the last eight years. And I'd gotten to know Carlos pretty well through uh, recruiting a lot of the players at Montverde. And uh, so he joined us this spring. Uh, both of those guys are great. Uh, we also have been very fortunate to have a full-time strength conditioning coach that works with our team in women's tennis and an athletic trainer who does the same. So they are with us every day. They travel with us. They're involved in training every day, all the time. Uh, you know, so those parts are great. I think a lot of the top division one schools around the country, I mean, they have similar setups oftentimes where you got academic advising, you know, everything is provided, tutors, you know, you've got a whole nutritional side of it too, that as players, we never had. And so the guys will come in and they'll get, you know, meals and, and, and snacks and all this stuff every day. You got a nutritionist and a dietitian that work with guys to help them to, uh, you know, help them to maximize their stuff. You, you got sports psychologists who do the same you know, you've got a counseling, you know, run of folks who do the same. I mean, you know, truthfully, in Division One college athletics today, um, I mean, it, it's more professional than most professional teams. Um, the difference is you don't have, you know, 28-year-old pros, 30-year-old pros, um, you know, and, and not everybody gets paid something, right? So, but besides that, the way that they can treat you and the opportunities that these young men and women have are just, it's insane. It really is insane. Very, very different than my, you know, all right, we'll give you a coupon for 50 bucks off some shoes. Uh, before we go to the game and load up in the vans, we're going to eat on your own at the dining hall and we're going to get some pizza delivered to the the vans after the game. And, and uh, you know, if my coach really hustled, then he got some T-shirts and shorts donated from the local businesses for practice gear. And if not, you had to wear the awful practice gear that you got from school and, you know, whatever it was. It's very, very different dynamic and experience 30 years later, uh, without a question. Yeah, I, 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 I can relate as, uh, you know, being being the senior captain, you got to drive the other van that coach wasn't driving. Right. So, yeah, I, I 100 percent, 100 percent. Those days are long gone. now. <laughs> yep. Yep. Well, coach, it, it, you talked about your staff. Uh, you want to give us some insight into your coaching style, the style of play that you, that you like to play, the kind of type of player that you look for when you're recruiting? Sure. So, you know, we pet play and, and have always played uh, a form of positional possession. And so the, the shape changes, you know, probably year to year based on the dominant players within the group at that time. We build a shape and a way to play around the, uh, whether it's two, three, four, five, whatever it is, guys that are most ready at the top of their game at that time. And then we fill in the squad with the rest of the guys that are the next best ones next best ready to go uh and so there'll be you know four three three four three three with inverted fullbacks 
four, three, three skewed out one side and two guys uh, more in central, right? Four, two, three, one with both seven and 11 inverted diamond four, four, two with, you know, two eights to six and a 10. Um, I mean, any formation you can think of, we've played that way because it fit, um, like I said, the dominant personnel in the group, but in general, it's philosophically always the same. It's a form of positional possession. Um, you know, a lot of people like to say, oh yeah, our team play. Well, no, our team plays. Um, and it's very, very difficult to do. And we do it against the very, very best teams in the country every year. And it takes time to teach guys to play that way because the time and space demands that, you know, we talked about earlier that are, that are just not present for players. Um, you know, in the, in the U S but it's the same abroad, to be honest. I mean, the, the, and I tell, you know, 20 years ago, if you recruited abroad, what you sold to these young men from wherever they were from is, Hey, here's a pathway to MLS, right? You come here two, three years, you, you score a lot of goals, you defend very well, you know, whatever position you play, you can move into MLS. Well, that's a very, very difficult jump now, right? Like that's not very realistic. Um, you know, when I began coaching in 1999, um, I mean, our first, one of my first spring games, we played the U S men's national team in, uh, we used to host, uh, Bruce's team in, in Birmingham all the time. And we have a game that's supposed to be closed doors. And we had like 25 school buses show up and the place was packed and Bruce was pissed, but that's another story for another time. Um, and we're competing at that level, right? And and you'd play spring games every spring two or three times against MLS teams. And, you know, the games were always close. It's probably comparable now to what it's like us playing, you know, spring games against the USL, whether it's USL 1 or USL Championship. It's similar. But now, you know, if we play an exhibition, which doesn't happen often um, in the spring, but if we play a game against the first 11 guys in MLS against my first 11, the gap is very big, right? And it's not that college has gotten worse. College has gotten better. Um, it's that the MLS has invested significantly more resources. And so the people they're buying in these roles, I mean, like we were watching the other night uh, while we were traveling, one of our guys from three years ago, he plays at St. Louis and he's a very good player, very, very talented young man. And we're watching him play against Miami, right? And it's like, okay, this guy who two years ago, three years ago was playing for us, um, he's not playing against Messi, Suarez, you, you know, all the lot. I mean, and look, Beckham came, yeah, and we had former players that I coached that played with David in, in uh, Los Angeles, but it was not a good level. I mean, it's still not the same as, you know, the Premier League or the Bundesliga or La Liga. Yeah, no, but the investment is so high. And so the jump is enormous. And the point of that is to say, I can't say to, you know, some kid in, in Norway or some kid in Germany, hey, this is a realistic path for you to come here and go to MLS. What I can say is the Division I men's game is very unique. Uh, and at the top end, it's super unique where the speed of the game, it never slows down. Right. And, and the substitution rules, although we've made some adaptations for this upcoming fall, it's not going to change it that much. It's just guys don't get fatigued because you can make subs and bring guys back on later in the game. And so in world football, if you're in one of these top youth academies, you still have the last 10 minutes or so of the first half and the last 15, 20 minutes of the game where the game starts to stretch and, and goals come and space is open. Well, the top end of the division one men's game, and I'm not talking about some game that somebody watched one time on TV or on, you know, a bad ESPN feed, um, you know, where the two teams just kicked the crap out of each other and, and it was all set pieces and all the rest. And yeah, there are games like that and there are aspects like that. And the truth is, our people in our country, they don't watch the championship. They don't watch the second division of whatever. You don't choose to watch the bottom funded teams in any of the top leagues because they play exactly the same way, by the way. Um, you don't go to too many pro games in our country because they look exactly the same with just higher level players. 
Um, but our game, it never slows. And, and so what it replicates a lot of times is it replicates a higher level standard and speed of play than what, you know, let's say you're, you're I use a former player as an example. We had a Spanish guy that came, um, oh, this is like maybe 2012, 2013. Uh, I think it was 2012. Came to us, was finishing high school, really good student. Uh, dad played for Barcelona for 10, 11 years. So they, they you know, it wasn't a dire straits kind of situation. Uh, he was a bright young man, wanted this as a pathway to the future. And I said, look, Manel, you know, I, I don't know that you're going to make the jump in the MLS. He was in the Tricera, which is the fourth tier in Spain at that time. I said, but what we can do is we can challenge you in ways that are different than what you would get there. And, you know, I don't think he was quite sure, but he's like, Hey man, great. I got a scholarship. I'd love to do it. So he comes, um, leaves there in, in a team in Tricera with not really a great pathway. Maybe he would max out up a level in two B comes here is not one of our best players um, plays on and off for three years. Um, graduates, excellent student the mls was just having more and more two teams that were starting to pop up and uh you know he chose to go back start and try sarah he was a striker that i think scored seven goals for us in three years he scored 34 goals in the second half of the season that year got signed by girona got promoted went to la liga um, spent four years, I think, at Girona and has now been popping around from one team to another in 2A, finishing out his career. And I, I went to watch him maybe after he'd been there for, I think, two or three years. And he was on loan in a club in 2A. And the entire roster is like Real Madrid, Barcelona, all these guys that were fringe players on their way down. Um, and I'm watching him and he's the starting nine. And he, again, he couldn't create for himself here. He couldn't get separation because the game was too fast. Uh, and, and I'm watching the game and the guy, what he learned here was he learned how hard he had to work for 90 minutes on both sides of the ball all the time to cope with and deal with the challenges at the top end of the college game. And the guy basically defended the entire front of the team by himself. The three guys behind him all played at Barcelona and Real Madrid. He basically defended for those three guys. Um, they subbed him in the 90 plus one. The 20,000 people clap him off for putting in the work. And the other guys have the quality to score two, three goals. And so what, what I learned about our game and where it's different is it creates an environment that's so different and so much higher level in many ways from MLS Next Pro, from whatever these different pathways that these young men can go into, because the speed of the game is just faster because you can substitute and you can bring guys back on. And so the game, it just never slows down. And, and I think that's one of the really unique pieces that if you play football to learn how to play and function in spaces that are realistically first division spaces in the majority of the world, not all with first division quality or choices or those things, but the time and space demands, you know, those things, if you play the way we play, you know, it creates habits and you learn lessons and you can really take, like we talked about early, most of our guys are guys that have aspirations to move on and play. And what does that mean? You de delay real life for five, six years, right? And, of the 140 or 150 guys that I've coached that have gone on to play professionally at all the different places I've worked, I mean, like four or five guys won't get a job after they retire, right? Like that's such a rare thing. That's a rare thing around the world to get to that level. But I, I do think it's a really unique opportunity still that exists in our country for young players uh, here and, and young players abroad to have the opportunity to continue to study but also to continue to develop and grow in ways that quite frankly, they're not going to grow other places, right? If our kids go and, and, you know, they move and they go to Portugal or they go to Spain or they go to Germany or these different places where they have access to passports. Um, 
yeah, you're in the youth team, you're in the third division. It's hard to make that jump of improvement if you don't have that quality to do it. And college in the top 30, 40, 50 places has pretty consistently been able to help players to bridge that gap. Um, and, and I think that's uh, that's an important piece that, you know, I don't think people talk about enough in the college game and, and the value that it has in our landscape. For sure. Well, Coach, you've been super generous with your time. Don't want to keep you too long. Just want to say thank you for for joining us and, and talking about VCU and the college game and wish you the best of luck this upcoming fall. And if you get down to Bradenton or IMG, you know, for any recruiting events, make sure to look me up and uh, we'll get together. All right. Absolutely. Appreciate it, Matt. Thanks for all you're doing. Thanks, Dave. Hi, everybody. It's Matt from Discover College Soccer. I hope you're enjoying the podcast, whether that's on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. I also wanted to let you know about the Discover College Soccer Study Table. This is our brand new online portal that is complete with a 14-part online course giving you all of the ins and outs of the college soccer recruiting process. There's also a wealth of resources such as checklists, templates. There's the spreadsheets that have every soccer program in the country along with their coaches, their contact information, their social media information, uh, some basic stats about the school and more. Plus there's an online community where you can ask your questions, share your wins, your losses, any questions that you may have around the college soccer recruiting process. It's all there at the Discover College Soccer study table that you can find at discovercollegesoccer.com slash study table and hopefully we will see you there.